Well, good morning, everyone here, uh, and hello to our online audience uh, as well. Um, this session is entitled The Right Stuff, A New Relationship with Materials. Um, just to start off, I would say, so we spend about 90% of our time in it. It accounts for 13% of global GDP. It employs 7% of us. The built environment is arguably the most underrated of all of the sectors of the economy. And our ability to build a safe, clean environment in which we can live and thrive, you know, that's part of the bedrock of civilization. But it's also at the heart of the energy transition. The sector contributes a third of material consumption and waste generation, and more than a third of fuel-related human CO2 emissions. In short, there's no way of achieving net zero without some big adaptations in the way we construct buildings and cities and live in them. And that's all the more so when you consider in the next four decades, we're projected around the world to build 30 billion square meters of new buildings. And just to put that into context, that's the equivalent of adding a new New York City every 40 days. It's kind of striking here. So we have an opportunity here and a big challenge. How are we going to make this happen without breaking all of our climate commitments? How are we going to do it fairly and sustainably? Can we enhance our living and working spaces along the way, not just making life cleaner, but making it better? These are some of the big questions I've been wondering about for some time. My name's Ed Conway. I, I, I'm the economics editor of Sky News. I've written a book called Material World, which is looking at some of this stuff as well. But more importantly, we've got a panel here uh, of people who are the real protagonists uh, in this story. Uh, so just brief introductions, and then we'll get on to the conversation. Arjun Dawan, uh, vice chairman, HCC, Hindustan Construction Company. Uh, Nolik Forrest over there, uh, chief, sustainability, uh, chief sustainability officer at Holcim, uh, one of the world's biggest cement and buildings materials companies. Uh, Christina Gamboa, uh, chief executive of the World Green Building Council. Uh, and Cohen von Ostrom, uh, who's the founder and chief executive of Edge, which is one of Europe's largest commercial property uh, developers. Now, just to start off, we'll do a quick question to, to every member of the panel, uh, which is kind of, where are you seeing the, the innovation, the exciting stuff within each of your organisations to address the quality of life, to curb climate impacts, just some of those big challenges I've laid out, or indeed where the materials you're getting are coming from? Should we just go one by one? Arjun, first of all. So we're a civil engineering business. Um, design is fundamental for us, and we're constantly looking to make our structures lighter. So for example, we're building an eight-lane expressway along the coastline of Mumbai, and um, to decongest the inner city center. But for the first time, we're using a monopile technology in, uh, in India, where it's the construction of a single column in the seabed and that bears the, the weight of the entire structure as opposed to it sitting on two legs of piers. Less carbon footprint, far more aesthetic, and less disturbance of the seafloor. And credit goes to our client, the municipal corporation, because it's never easy for a public sector entity to accept, you know, a path breaking design. Design in um, mixed use of our, of our materials, um, um, use of industrial byproducts to lower the amount of clicker content in the concrete we use, and so that in recent years we've actually reduced the amount of cement that we use in some of our projects for up to about 35 to 50%. And then we're big advocates of trying to push more steel uh, into our design vis-a-vis -vis concrete because steel is just far more circular. Um, we're weighted quite heavily in, you know, with regard to concrete in certainly South Asia and India. Um, steel is more expensive, it's higher maintenance, but it's easier to work with, it's faster. And now I think with the advent of new materials, including new paints like C5, you've got 25-year maintenance-free periods for steel, so hopefully you'll see a more circular steel usage um, you know, in the years to come. Okay, Christina. Thank you. So from the World Green Building Council, we are a leading platform that has a green building councils in over 80 countries that engage with 46,000 companies. And we've been around for a while, and our innovation is that we need more collaboration between us and amongst the industry because no one actor can really get this over the line. But in the collaboration that, I, that I'm talking about is around, like we're doing today, bringing awareness, as you said, Ed, this topic of the built environment is one of the highest uh, potential solutions to the climate problem and bringing quality of life worldwide in 
countries that are still urbanizing at a very high rate and making sure that the decarbonization efforts that are now underway in the sector that are flagged at the COP process, for example, with the goals of doubling the energy efficiency rate and tripling renewables, built environment is just in the center of that. So our, our innovation is that collaboration to bring better buildings a, a reality. And those better buildings today are the ones that are resilient, that are zero carbon, that are driving the circular economy as a hierarchy of achieving those goals. And of course, uh, driving forward new ways and business models that can bring more, let's say, uh, peace of mind for policymakers to do the right policies and the finance community to invest the money that goes into the sector in the right sort of assets by having radical collaboration and transparency, making sure that we can enable this. So, so maybe it's not a new innovation, but I guess the era that we are today is around that, tr that collaboration on doing the respo responsible things that can change the trajectory that we're on. Okay. Thank you, Carla. When we um, started the whole journey to go to net zero buildings, uh, we did a lot of work first on operational carbon, so the carbon in the, in the daily operation of a, of a building. Um, and we, we made big steps, but then we found out that a big part of the problem, of course, is in the materials. And we, uh, we started to analyze that. Um, and one of the things that we recently did is we started to work with wood, with CLT in, uh, in the building. Um, currently, we made a building that's the largest wooden building in, in Germany. Very difficult uh, from a regulation and, and building code perspective. Um, people think that, uh, that wood, by definition, is, is more dangerous than, than other materials. Uh, we don't think that that is uh, so much the case, but it's, um, it's, it's important to then work together. Um, it takes a lot longer then to convince uh, uh, the municipality to work with you and to do it. But in the end, if you see the product when it's done, um, not only is it, is it a building that has a much more lower uh, carbon uh, uh, footprint, but at the same time, just if you walk around in the building, it feels so much nicer and so much better. And I think that's the win-win that we're looking for. That's quite exciting. Nolik, I know you have lots of... Yeah, so maybe to put into perspective all the context that have been shared. So the built environment, as you said, Ed, uh, can play a vital role in our world's net zero transition and energy transition. It represents 37% of our world's greenhouse gas emissions. 10% of emissions, as you mentioned, happen through the materials at the construction phase. 27% of emissions are linked to heating, cooling, and powering the building in its use. So it's the operational footprint. So at Wholesome, we're on a mission to decarbonize building, tackling these two phases, but also the end of life by making all our materials circular. So what are we doing at the construction phase? We're decarbonizing hard to abate materials, cement and concrete, uh, by using a whole range of levers from low carbon formulation to decarbonized energy. And for all the emissions that we cannot abate using those levers today, we have CCUS projects to capture all the remaining unavoidable emissions. So within this next decade, we're going to be ready to produce 8 million tons of uh, net zero cement per annum. And that is basically a huge step towards getting to this net zero construction ambition that we all share. But also we're reinventing concrete to make it low carbon, as we mentioned, but also to enable it to be much more circular. People don't realize it, but concrete is just as recyclable as glass. You can, re you can recycle 100% of concrete in an infinite loop, and we're building up the infrastructure to make that happen today. But we can also use concrete to build better with less, using smart design, as you mentioned. Design is essential mm -hmm. to use the minimal amount of material for maximum strength with the performance analysis across the entire life cycle of the building. So we're reinventing concrete to make it an advanced sustainable <coughs> building solution so that it can play its role in this net zero transition that we're all embarked on. Thank you, Noig. Um, Arjun, I mean, you, you were talking, you're, you're there actually you know, building enormous big projects. You're there at the fr front of this, really. So, you know, where do you see, you mentioned steel, but where do you see the kind of various opportunities in terms of trying to kind of bring down emissions? So let me talk about um, <clears throat> how stuff is built. Uh, at least in, in India, we have barely scratched the surface in the use of prefabricated components, you know, in construction. It's less than about 2%. So whether it's a prefab concrete slab or it's a, a prefab segment that goes into a bridge or a tunnel, um, a lot of this can actually be manufactured, <clears throat> excuse me, on mass, off-site, um, and actually be transported to the site for assembly. And you, know, the, you have huge economies of scale, which would then reduce the carbon footprint by about you know, 16, 17%. Let me give you an example in India, where building out um, our mass transit sy sy um, infrastructure, uh, our <clears throat> uh, metro undergrounds all across India, 
Uh, these are hundreds of kilometers of tunnel and rail that's being linked underground. And if you just simply take the, the, the concrete segment lining of a tunnel, uh, which is a standardized product for all the tunnels across the country, you end up having the ability to actually, when you scale, and you know, the volume gives you that opportunity to allow to have mass production of these segments, for example, off-site, outside the city centers, you have less pollution in the city, and then what you end up doing also is freeing up about five to seven acres of prime real estate in each of your construction sites, which would normally be used for casting yards. So that's an example. Mm. That's really interesting. I mean, and, and I suppose part of the, the other challenge with this is, is not just the application, but kind of un the data, understanding what is actually happening here, understanding the impact, understanding mm -hmm. the opportunities. I mean, is that something, Christina, that, that you have been looking at? Yes, totally. I guess uh, in the last few years, we, I mean, or for, I think the industry, the construction industry, <clears throat> has been, uh, let's say, shifting towards a, a, a greater understanding of performance and having data. You cannot uh, manage what you, you don't measure. And this sector was not very good, still maybe, not very good at having information around all the life stages and all the, the let's say the processes, the engineering, the architecture, where are the, the, the design points, for example, where you can really with your handprint reduce and, and create efficiencies in carbon. And also to the end of life, also there, we're just getting started on understanding the materials passport side and the, the, the relevance mm -hmm. of, of uh, things that have been in the industry. So from a data point of view, the industry now has some excellent data points that need to be scaled up. And those go around, for example, the environmental product declarations that have been valued by voluntary rating tools for some decades now, bringing transparency on the performance and for people to better specify. But that, now we know it's not enough. Now the proper mix of the use of those gives us it's systems that can go into the building, different sorts of systems, depending on the climate and the use, the energy intensity, to get the right mix of design so you, you don't over-specify, right, the amounts of materials or you don't over-engineer a building just because you just put, pop in things that you need. So there's more data there now making decisions. And then when you, in the construction site, the, the efficiency in construction also allows you to track that your site is now carbon free, that you're using clean construction methodologies and making sure you're not, not creating efficiencies. I don't know if you know this, but most, almost 20% sometimes of materials used in construction sites just go to waste because in the construction site they were not properly managed and properly tracked. And then at the end of phase, make sure that it doesn't go to landfill. And here we have cities making regulations on stopping waste to landfill in the construction site. The, the waste to landfill in, the, in construction is almost 50% of, of the waste that comes from the construction industry worldwide. So making sure that there's mandatory requirements on recycling the end of life. Mm -hmm. Now there's a data on the use of, a, a, let's say, assembly, no, designed for disassembly and for recyclability. There's more data on that. And I guess there's more transparency in a, that, that confidence building that Nolik was talking about around evidence that secondary materials are feasible for that they're not hazardous and that they are, can also achieve the structural integrity you need because that's the confidence building. And so that you really stop this madness of just using virgin materials in a lineal way and that can we really can reboot that circular economy and the great thing is that around the, that life cycle of buildings that I try to to express here there's data points and there's policy there's regulation and business really saying that if they measure it they can have even a more uh, let's say more margins more profit while being responsible in managing all this process okay that's that's so it's encouraging so it is getting better Yes. Uh, and, and actually, Nolik, I want to bring you in here because you know you were talking about circularity a lot for a lot of people. You know who who understand a bit about cement, a bit about concrete. They might have assumed that it was just you know once and done. But actually, you 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 know you have some interesting projects that you're working on that suggest it's totally different. Yeah, actually, circularity is a bit of a game changer for us right now. Um, our whole adventure started in Zurich, actually, because the public authorities made it mandatory to recycle at least 20% of materials mm -hmm. in all of their public works. 
So our research teams had to figure out, okay, how do I put 20% recycled content in you know, our cement and concrete? Uh, and that's what gave us the platform to get going on this. Um, and we produced the world's very first cement that was four years ago with 20% recycled construction demolition materials inside. And we realized that by doing this, actually we're taking the concrete at its end of life, and if we process it and crush it down to its most finest level, we can actually recuperate the cement paste. And it becomes a decarbonized raw material in the formulation of new cement. So today we can basically take the demolition, that we recuperate the cement paste to actually reduce 40% of the footprint of new cement. Uh, that's a pretty uh, significant breakthrough. So by doing this, uh, we can literally take old buildings and reduce the footprint of the next generation of buildings by, uh, by basically having this closed loop system. But what we, what we can, to scale this up, our vision is in every single metropolitan area where we operate, we want to make circular construction happen. The infrastructure does not exist today and the regulatory landscape is just getting going. So we're basically uh, building up the infrastructure as we speak. Um, we were engaging at the EU level. This year they changed their cement uh, regulatory principles to allow between five and 35% of recycled demolition materials in the formulation of cement. So that gives us a platform to engage with every single national government and every single municipal community to get them to adapt their building codes to embrace circularity. And by doing that, we basically can you know, reduce the footprint, but also reduce the amount of virgin materials that we use. Um, and so right now we've got about 100% eco-cycle recycling centers in operation around the world, and we want to scale that up as much as possible. In Europe alone, we're going to get to about 150 recycling centers by 2030. So this is happening. Circular construction is a key part of our decarbonization journey, and it just requires connecting the dots across all these things. Yeah, so there's a big coordination thing, and I, I do want to come back to that, actually. Coordination, policy, regulation, what kind of role do you know, institutions have on this? But actually, Cohen, you, you were talking, you know, as a developer, you were talking about uh, timber, I presume that's cross-laminated timber, this exciting new building material that's, that's, you know, a lot of people are making lots of noise about, but in practice, you know, what are the opportunities and what are the challenges? And actually, does it go beyond the kind of environmental question? Is there something about the, you know, the physiological, the psychological implications when you're thinking of building with these different materials? There is, and um, what we've learned is that uh, we're, back in the day I thought everything that you build in wood would be much better than building it in, in concrete. Today, that's not always the case. Uh, concrete is becoming so much better that, you know, always when you build with wood, you also have to do part of that in, in steel cement, especially when you build high rises. So it's already really looking at the model and, and trying to optimize. But the big factor that our tenants like is that they're in a space that looks a little bit like a living room. And for, um, when you start to look at the, the health part of a building, and that's something that already six, seven years ago, so before COVID, in interviews, it showed that a lot of our tenants were talking not so much about net zero. Then I'm talking about the people that are actually working in a building, not so much the, maybe the, the big companies that have a net zero promise, but actually people really working there, they said, hey, for me, the air quality is important, the light in a building. And they read about toxics in all kinds of materials, and they, they talked about the look and feel, and, some people already then wanted to work from home because they had a feeling that working from home with the plants and the green around them would be more, more positive. Now, a lot of work has been done. Um, we have different research centers in the world that have been looking at you know, what does health do in the building. And it turns out that um, if you now follow the, the Well Institute and uh, you go to a well rating <coughs> of your building, and you take all these different parts together in the design of the building, use different materials, more light in the building, more <coughs> natural light, <coughs> Um, that there's so much more that you can do uh, to have that, that satisfaction. And it, uh, it proves that uh, indeed uh, the virus load in those kinds of buildings is a lot lower, so the chances of getting COVID is, uh, is much reduced. And how, how, how was that? How was the virus load lower? Um, it's, it's very simple. Um, um, we measure CO2. CO2 sensors are you know, very, very cheap now, nowadays. Um, and we just make sure that the air circulation is very right, different so than it was back, thing. Okay, in, uh, right. back in the day. Yeah. But if you look at the materials, I think 10 years ago we would just put everything in the building which was cheap and sort of looked nice. And nowadays there's so much more information out there that we know exactly what material have toxics in it. Uh, some materials uh, uh, you cannot use if you uh, build a, a baby crib. But exactly. you are allowed to do it massively in a building. And right, I see. Know about those, those materials, and now we've decided not to use those anymore. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. I mean, Christina, did you have a thought on that? Yeah, I had an yeah. example. For a long time, we thought, I, I don't know if you, but we're old, as old as, in terms of, we thought that 
that smell, it's new smell, right? The paint, it's yeah. all so great, it's new. Oh my God, that was so toxic. That paint <laughs> cannot <laughs> go into the wood, into the cribs, into the furniture, it's ridiculous. So what we've done in this industry through the EPDs and everything is bring the chemical industry and all the specifiers to be transparent in what is putting, what is in there. The asbestos also, for example, is another example that comes to mind. All the transparency brought now a challenge where you can, that just is a no, because it goes against the health of workers and all the invisible people also that are around the life cycle of the building. So, so are all that healthy from the design phase, but also from, from the handling of the materials, from us as users making sure that uh, the systems are made for, for making sure that in the 90% indoors, we can be the best we can be is super critical and that, that has been a game changer and that has brought also a lot of, of a change in the pollution that comes downstream that we don't see from all those industries that also would use those sort of very bad inputs. Which was, that's really interesting and, and I mean, I, I suppose this is not just, it's not just about data, it's not just about innovation, so it's not just about materials, this is an economic kind of story and, and for you, Arjun, you know, you have a large workforce. There are presumably, are there labor implications of when you're kind of thinking about new materials, new building practices? What, what, you know, what are those kinds of things that you're looking ahead and seeing? Well, when one looks at trade-offs, I think, you know, it's, it's entirely complementary, actually, in, in India, both short-term and long-term. Um, you know, India finally has an infrastructure program it deserves. You have about a trillion dollars of spend that's happening every five to seven years. And the construction sector is the second largest employer of labor in the country. It borrows some of this from the agricultural sector off season. And what we've seen in, in recent years with the demand of agricultural produce also increasing with the planting of perennial crops, the migrant labor um, that used to come to various part, from various parts of India and urban centers, by the way, where the cost of living is higher, is starting to tighten. All right. COVID didn't make this easier as well because you know, understandably people wanted to be closer to home. So I think there's a you know, fundamental balance that we have to achieve between labor and skilled labor and mechanization and you know, um, new, new building materials and, and tooling. And, and you know, this also then, for a developing country like India, creates new jobs for the future. Okay, but also, I mean, there's, there's another issue, and a, a quick kind of follow-up to you, but then I wanna bring this to Nolik as well. You know, affordability, it's, it's not a trivial question, is it? And, you know, this, this in particular, India is a, com is a country which is building a lot, developing, seeing the standards of living increasing. So that balancing act between things that, you know, are cleaner, are more novel, building materials, and it being affordable for those, you know, who are eventually going to end up paying for it. Presumably, you're quite conscious of that, are you? Yeah, we, we, we have to be. I think we can certainly be doing better. I think... Um, we have to actually you know, serve the aspirations of hundreds of millions of Indians. And um, I think that the, the government is, is extremely conscious of this. I think that you, know, you, you have to, first of all, be able to experiment and also be ready to fail. And the public sector is, is certainly in many, many parts of the world, and especially India, wary of doing that. A um, couple of examples, you know, um, at least on the, on the heavy civil side. Ministry of Transport, for example, has um, experimented with, um, in a couple of highways, the substitution of soil with urban waste. And, um, you know, we don't know whether some of these experiments are going to basically fail or succeed, but what you end up then having is at least um, an attempt to do so, um, which I think in the long run is something that you need to play with. But I think that the, this is a trade-off that's a very hard question to answer. Hard, you know, yeah. I think that there, there's no getting around the fact that we will have new construction. Mm. Um, and, you know, the three R's, recycle, refurbish, you know, re repurpose, is, are still very, very expensive. I mean, there's people on the panel that are a better place to answer that question, but the fourth R, which I find interesting, which is reduce, is right. also something that we need to <laughs> you know, continue to consider. We, we all consume, I think, yeah. a bit much than we should. Mm. We can't, but we can't forget, can we, that, you know, for, for, you know, concrete for a lot of people is an enormous enhancement on what might have come before, you know, a concrete floor rather than what was there before might, might be an improvement. So living standards, you know, have been improved enormously by the deployment of yeah. concrete and but steel yeah. around the world. Yeah, let's remember the, the, the concrete is also the most resilient. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're talking about climate change, etc. And I think, you know, hearing wonderful things about how this is now going to hopefully become recyclable. Um, I, I was going to say, but just, not like... Mm. 
you, you have these amazing new kind of exciting recipes for how you're going to make concrete lower carbon. How, you know, how can you ensure that people are going to be able to afford it? How can you ensure that whether it's developers or whether it's you know, people in, in sites are going to actually use this? Because presumably that's not a straightforward question either. Yeah, a very good question. So when we embarked on our mission to decarbonize building at scale, one of the principles is we have to make sustainable building accessible to all. So when we launched our EcoPack Low Carbon Concrete uh, two and a half years ago with at least 30% lower CO2 footprint inside, we said we're just going to make this our mass market product. We're not going to charge a premium. This needs to be adopted by as many people as possible. So just make this product scalable. So that's been our overarching principle is to make low carbon construction possible at scale. Um, and we're part of projects today that honestly, if you use concrete at its best, right, and you use not only its strength properties, but also its energy efficiency properties, we are part of passive buildings that make buildings self-sufficient from an energy perspective. So they're super affordable uh, to run. Uh, they become super cost effective from an energy perspective uh, to, to run for people actually who live inside. So in Vienna, we're part of a, a school project that we launched last year that is self-sufficient and uh, it generates all its energy on site, so zero energy costs. So if you design buildings the right way, you can make sustainable building affordable. Um, we also, to make this message a bit louder around the world, we engaged with Norman Foster Foundation at the Venice Biennale of Architecture last year to create an essential home. You know, bring, boil down a home to what are its most essential elements and make it as sustainable as possible. And we did that. And now we're basically working on taking that experiment from Venice in an exhibition area to actually bringing it out into the world in real affordable housing. And I can see Sheila Patel in the room here a pioneer in affordable housing, resilient housing, for the most vulnerable populations in the world. Uh, we work together and roof over our head. We need to make a resilient, affordable housing sustainable for everyone, because otherwise we're not going to fix this problem. There's, there's a coordination thing as well here, isn't there? Because you know, in order to make a lot of this stuff happen, you know, for instance, uh, net zero concrete, you're going to need carbon capture, at least in the, in the kind of short and medium term. And so there's a coordination thing. There's a policy challenge as well. I, I wondered, you know, Christina, do you want to talk a bit about that policy challenge? Because this, this presumably is not going to happen without some form of, you know, policy management as well. Yeah. Oh, I wish I had the, the, the answer for, it, for that in a simple way. But I would say, in a way, <coughs> maybe going, that, going back, um, and this links to affordability and the responsibility of governments to be able to be having an enabling environment to have uh, people have access to homes, to solutions, to, ur to good urban environments, to quality of life. And we've had a policy failure. Uh, we have a billion people living in informal settlements worldwide, and right now that's gonna go up to two billion or more, or four, I just know, the stats are blurry by 2050. If we don't get the right sort of policy frameworks to address the affordability and go head on with a solution of how to help business set up, be a, set up for success in this sort of environment in a way where we don't do away with the virgin materials, we recycle and we, and we do solutions that are fit for the local needs because that, uh, it also goes to sense of place, of culture. For my family, it may be different what I value in my home mm -hmm. than for a family in Europe and Africa. So the policy response has to go, let's say, hand in hand maybe with three things, regulation, information and incentives. In terms of regulation, we need to have performance-based codes. If there's performance-based codes, then the local industry can decide the right appropriate of solutions, of systems that can make that house a reality in a way that it is affordable to run. Explain a performance-based code. Yes, so, it, so for example, I would, in, in a, instead of just having a construction code that you use, right, and it's, there's a lot of regulation in the sector you have to comply, but if I, if I ask you, you have to assure me that in the operation of this building, you will meet this sort of energy efficiency, you will meet this sort of water savings, then with the resources in Mumbai or the I will charge climate, you more. Then you, then you design to meet to that, so that house with the right sorts of materials right. is going to perform in that way. Right. 
You can use recycled materials, whatever you want. But then when you're, then that enables the decarbonization efforts, circularity efforts in a way where you don't do away with prescriptive methods, but you promote innovation. So saying performance-based is you let the industry a space to innovate and make sure that they do the buildings that are needed in a way that is profitable and affordable. So that's the one point in regulation. Second, in terms of materials, there has to be, uh, let's say, incentives for um, uh, the value chain uh, absorbing no? that recyclability and durability and, of course, making sure that industry is also disclosing information. The Energy Performance Directive in Europe, uh, now as it is right now, by 2030, will mandate whole life carbon disclosure. And that will mean that you will have to have transparency on a, and, they, and that will bring the data for the regulation to continue to improve on targets like there is in Denmark or the circularity goals that there is in the Netherlands. So that's regulation. Information would be roadmaps to enable collaboration between governments in order to inspire the local solutions that have worked in others more quickly because we need to leapfrog. There's too much to do. And the construction product regulations, for example, in the EU is now having comparable information around circularity of products and making sure that there's confidence in the market. There's an interesting thing around extended product responsibility happening in France, uh, for example, where you will have, for example, to show that products are designed for their end of life or, or things. So that's Regulation information. <laughs> and uh, the, final, the final point I said was uh, around uh, incentives. Because we, there's a lot of inertia here. We've done things too much the same way. It's been an industry that is conservative. Productivity hasn't changed. So there has to be some sort of incentives in terms of, for example, giving you more floor space to design and meet the performance-based code or being creative. It doesn't have to be money flowing back to the sector, but that you really get some, some carrots and sticks working in the right way. Okay, well, that's brilliant. Um, Cohen, I want to come to you in a second, but just Arjun, you, you, you had a response of when you know, talking about that kind of dynamic point. Well, yeah, you know, uh, the government is the, the largest, um, is the owner and the largest consumer of public infrastructure. Um, it is also the rule maker. So policy has to, in some cases, be top down. I mean, a couple of examples, um, you know, jokes aside, um, you know, at least on larger infrastructure projects, you know, urban infrastructure projects, the government can mandate a certain minimum procurement of material, you know, the threshold, 30, 35 percent of it to come from, you know, certain, you know, whether it's prefabricated, you know, products or certain kinds of, you know, greener cement, et cetera, so on and so forth. Um, what it also then does is signal immediately to the private sector to plan, you know, to retrofit or to actually, you know, give the right incentives so that, you know, in two years, the private sector knows the demand is going to exist. Huh? So that's a cru that is a crucial role. Yeah. Cohen, I, you wanted to come in, and I, I don't know if it was on, we definitely wanted to catch, uh, cover material passports, but was yeah. that what you wanted to talk about? Well, maybe one quick reaction to uh, what Christina was saying. Um, we, uh, what we are seeing is that a lot of municipalities have difficulties with all the innovation that is now happening. It's, mm -hmm. it's going so fast, and let's be honest, that's not the way our governments and our, our cities are organized. So there's a couple of examples how they solve that, and one is in Belgium, for example, where you don't get the building permit anymore from the municipality. You can go to an engineering company that is licensed to do so, uh, and they will check everything. They have a much yeah, easier look at all the innovations that are possible. And you might think then, is that not getting more dangerous? But there's an insurance company behind it, and they will then check on that uh, engineering company, and they will ensure the outcome of that, of that whole process. Of course, the government is still there to keep an eye out if the whole process is done in a proper way. But we believe there's much more possibility for innovation there than what you see in a normal in a normal process. So one example of where municipalities could sort of, you know, beef their game up and, and do better than they did in the past. Okay, and and, and material passports is another thing that's talked about a lot yeah. in here and other sectors like batteries as well. You're excited about that as well, are you? Yeah, de definitely. It, it's, so, it's so great that, you know, back in the day we would make a building and then the building would have a certain performance and we would have tenants there to pay for that performance. But the building itself, we didn't really see as something valuable. Uh, and at the same time, there's so many materials in there that have an, an end-of-life value uh, that we should harvest. And also when we sell a building, we don't want to just say, oh, this building can be used for 20 years and then it's worth nothing anymore, you have to build a new building. We want to say, hey, 
you know, after that you can do all kinds of other things, but all these materials in there have a value as well, uh, because we can reuse the aluminium and the steel. But in order to do so, you have to map that out and mm -hmm. make very specific how that works. And mm -hmm. we have done that, um, and we have um, uh, done it together with a European organization called Madaster that helps mm -hmm. you to, uh, to specify exactly what is out there. Now, the jury is still out if the investors are uh, willing to pay more for those kinds of buildings where that is happening. Um, also, the investment industry can sometimes be you know, not on the forefront of innovation, but a little bit lagging on some of those, uh, those things. But we, are, we have no doubt that we will see over time that those buildings that have these passports will be, uh, you know, will be the winners in the game. Okay, I want to take some questions from the audience in just a second, but I just want one more question for Noleg because it, it, it's, it's very relevant to that theme, is, is the question of kind of procurement. I mean, you talked about Zurich being, you know, having various, uh, various kind of recommendations. I guess they were regulations on, on concrete. Th this kind of thing matters, I assume. So, you know, what is the role for procurement? Well, I think what we've heard here is that the innovations exist today to get to net zero building and maybe even net positive and regenerative buildings. We need to open up the market. And opening up the market, it means getting the right regulatory uh, norms in place. It means getting people to real estate uh, developers to actually specify these solutions in their products. So how do we accelerate the opening up of the green market is actually through procurement. Through, uh, so we need a broad understanding across the entire value chain of what's possible today. And I, I love that Belgium example because there is a huge bottleneck between what's possible today and the adoption in the market. So how do we relieve that bottleneck? It's by making people more aware but also making the system more conducive to adopting these new innovations. So if that Belgium example could be replicated, that could go uh, a long way, I think. So making, connecting the dots across the building value chain and making people aware of what's possible is great. And we've got groups like the Davos Bau Alliance Kultur that are bringing the ecosystem together because the more we become aware of all these solutions, the faster we can adopt them. And the more scalable they become, the more affordable they are, right? So I think it's important to connect the dots across the entire value chain. Okay, now I have a zillion more questions, but I'm gonna pause for a second uh, to ask if anyone in the audience had some questions. We've got some uh, microphones that we can bring to you. So put your hands up if you do. If you don't, there's oh, the question over here from the lady here. There's a microphone which I think will be brought across to you. Yeah, oh, oh, there we are, <laughs> it's right in front of you. It's right. Okay, there it is. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, that's, that's working. I'm Sheila Patel. Uh, I run this campaign where two of my major partners are sitting here. It's called Roof Over Our Heads. And it's to remind everybody talking about construction materials that all the people in the Global South that represent almost 50% today and I think more, as you said, when people, more people come into the cities, who design, construct, and finance their own homes. They're the people who build your houses. They're the people who serve all of us in the Global South, and there's no university, there are no building material codes, there are no, there's nothing there for them to learn how to do things differently in a world that has changed completely mm. with extreme heat, winds that are taking roofs. That's how our campaign started. So I feel that in these conversations, while you all mention about migration, urban populations, the Global South has a huge, challenge of dealing with these illegal, informal, and invisible habitats that today, you know, we talk about policy related to materials, but you have ancient, uh, you know, almost, uh, you know, crazy laws that make most of the people who live informally in cities illegal. You don't provide, the city cannot provide them water and sanitation. Nobody can do anything with them, but they are there and they are growing and disasters are going to increase. So I feel somewhere in this very technical discussion, the quality and value and investment you want to make in poor people's lives is very important. And I just, I, I've come here to remind all of you about yeah. that. Mm. And just to do a little PR, which is not bad, is that on the basis of the work we've all done, we've actually created a mechanism for poor women to identify the materials that they use and develop a resilience index. Okay. We don't get, we, we sort of are in the cusp of either being developmental, people don't like to talk about materials and constructions in social development work, 
So I think these kind of awkward things have to come into mm -hmm. mainstream discussion. Just in the name of your organization for the online audience? It's called, uh, the campaign is called Roof Over Our Heads. Okay, thank and you. And it's a flagship program of the Race to Resilience. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that comment. And of course, this is, you know, people want to improve their lives. People want to improve their lives across the world. And, you know, that, that is an enormous part of And this. if I can add to that, because we're so proud to be working <coughs> with Sheila in this work, it's so important and materials matter in this game. And um, in this project that we worked on with uh, Norman Foster for the Venice, Venice Biennale, we created a new product. Basically, it's a concrete canvas because we can't bring concrete to uh, these uh, informal settlements. And so now we've got this, uh, it's like a textile fabric, and we just spray concrete on it to bring the strength of concrete. But actually, the main bulk of the material is, uh, is a fabric, it's, it's canvas. So it becomes something you can really easily deploy, uh, build on your, with the unskilled labor, uh, you know, it's modular. Uh, we were able to deploy this solution with the earthquake in Morocco recently. We could e immediately bring the solution. So innovation in materials also happens with that in mind, to make them affordable and accessible to people who need it the most. Let's just see, do we have any more questions? Because I've got a couple more, but it would be great if uh, anyone from the audience wanted to add a question or a comment. So I will ask, I, I will ask about innovation, because that, that is, you know, one of the overarching questions here is how are we going to spur innovation? What happens, I guess, also, you know, we're, we're hoping that there's going to be more policy coordination, but what happens in the absence of that? You know, these, these are realistic issues that people working in business, working in policy need to kind of think about. Uh, how do we create better awareness and education? Do we want to just, uh, Arjun, you, you take that, th those first and then maybe Christina afterwards. Sure. I, I... Education awareness, I mean, I think the best solutions are the democratic bottom-up ones. Um, yeah, I went to a, a fitness farm once where everything I consumed had a calorie content associated with it, and voila, I consumed less. Um, and, you know, everybody has a smartphone today, you know, um, <clears throat> rich, poor. And so I think that we talked about this, but I think it's time we started measuring our carbon footprint, yeah. the waste, the quality of the air we breathe, by the way, which transcends rich and poor. And... Politics around the world, certainly most parts of the world, especially in India, is about performance. And then you actually probably maybe bring in, you know, I think the, the, the best ambassadors for these change, you bring in, you know, children. I mean, these my boys are the biggest ambassadors for change in, in, in our home. You somehow, besides the stuff you teach them at home, embed something in their curriculums in school and university. You start to, you know, have that broad awareness across society, and then hopefully you'll see in the years to come some material change as a result. That's, that's hopeful. Christina? Yes, I think that's great. I mean, consumers have a huge role to play. We've seen a great uh, wave of change, for example, in awareness with the e-vehicles, right? And it's something that some people use for transformation. I, I, transportation, I prefer public transport. But there's also the availability beyond the consumer information flow of the understanding that all this matters to their productivity, their health, their sense of place. Uh, the finance industry is the gem in this, in this conversation if the policy response is slow. Because the, the no, no, there's no doubt this is going to be, there's going to be new buildings. There's going to be retrofits in Europe. This is going to happen. Money is flowing. But right now, most of it is going to the wrong sort of assets. Money is flowing into refurbishing even those informal settlements, probably to the wrong sort of mixes. So we need... First, the finance community to continue to ask the construction industry to speak the same language, agree on the topics to, so they can shift where they're going to be investing, right? And that can help a lot in this, in this landscape and create, again, this ambition loop and policy or, and, and give policy the, the security that it, they can give more policy signals that are right. And of course, into the other segments, make sure that the microfinance industry is also being creative and innovative to get to the lower segments of the population that possibly, the lower income that possibly have an informal job, don't have a track record of credit, but we know those barriers can be brought down and that is a whole range of things that the finance community and consumers can do without waiting. We don't need to wait. This, this transformation is, 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 is on. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. But thank you so much to panelists here. Just a very quick final thing for me. As a journalist, my point is awareness. We need more awareness. Mm -hmm. We need to remember that this stuff is not boring. It's incredibly important. 
And the more we understand why materials matter, why building, why construction matters, the jeopardy, but also the opportunity, the better. So the more we understand this, the better. But anyway, um, I'm going to hand over now, just at the end, to Jeff Merritt. He's the head of uh, the Centre for Urban Transformation uh, at the World Economic Forum, who just has a few words uh, to finish this off. But thank you very much to the panellists. Thank you, Ed, and, and to all of our panelists here. You know, before this session started, I was saying to Ed, I don't think we could have a session like this a few years ago. Uh, we were in a very different place. There wasn't this optimism, this hope that you heard here today. And don't get me wrong, we have a lot of obstacles ahead, but we have incredible, incredible leadership that you saw here on the stage. Just a couple months ago, I was with some of our partners in Barcelona, and we as the forum launched the first model policy for whole life carbon assessments. And now we're working with cities around the world to really rethink the way in which we construct and manage buildings. And as Nolig referenced, one year ago, actually this week, we joined with the government of Switzerland and 31 countries around the world, as well as real estate, construction, finance companies to launch the Davos Valcator Alliance. And I think one of the takeaways for me, something you said, Christina, is this is a collaborative effort. And it's something that we at the World Economic Forum as the International Organization for Public Private Cooperation take very seriously. We invite all of you, both in the room and online, to join the effort here. You can go online to DavosAlliance.org. You can be part of this effort to really transform the built environment, but in doing so, transform the future for our kids, for future generations. So we invite you to be part of this. Um, and today, we hope, is the beginning of a new era for the built environment uh, and for all of us as we move towards a brighter future. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.